Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, I'll sort of building the session on what the two speakers previously sort of mentioned, really the emphasis on community engagement. But before I get to sort of a model we, we're developing at the moment, just want to take you back a bit, and I'm going to do a few sort of slides, and during that, just use the self-reflection, just for you to think where are you on this continuum that we will discuss shortly. So there's been a lot of discussion about the missing link in terms of the Ebola sort of containment, and perhaps that I would argue perhaps the, one of the main link, missing links are that sort of this early and meaningful engagement of, as we said earlier, the trusted community leaders, and really also the validation of lay community knowledge. Quite often, the real knowledge of the insiders, the community members, are just being rejected and just ostracized. And that's important if we really want to develop contextually appropriate responses that align with sort of the community um, protocol because then that way they can tell us and together in partnership what to do and how to do it in partnership with the communities. And we know, as we can see from all the data we get, that the persistent and often increasing risk of infection both at sort of healthcare facility, facility level and communities and across the two settings, it really, to me, illuminates that limitations of the real conventional biomedical approaches that we apply. We can see that in terms of IPC and disease contain, containment, not only Ebola, but if you go back a bit, think about TB, MDR, XDR, HIV, what are we doing? Are we really doing better? Certain aspects we are, but from the community side, are we really engaging? And if not, why not? And how can we do that? One of the limitations to me from the IPC side is this is what I call the exclusivity, because the two pivotal components we keep forgetting is the community members. They are ultimately the two beneficiaries. So for control, infection control, we want them to have the benefit, and also the broader community system. And by that, we mean the structures of the community, the organizations, the people, the assets, and again, I will explain that in a minute. And also, we're very much trapped in this whole deficit mentality framework. We look at disease, disease, needs, problems, and quite often it's from the very outsider perspective. So we're looking into communities, you've got disease, you've got Ebola, you've got poverty, everything is problem, problem. So from a community side, you start believing that, and you think, well, only the outside people People can help me because I can't because we're collective of problems but then you become that submissive sort of recipient of care you're no longer actively involved you give up and it also start eroding responsibility empowerment and in the end you don't own the problem or the solution and other people take it over and last night I was watching BBC World News and I interviewed quite a few people working in Ebola areas and also the community must own both the problem is there, but also the solution. We must work with the communities. We also have this expert trap that we always think the outside experts, we can fly them in, they know the best, they must know the best. Yes, they have knowledge, but it's also very limited. And again, it's back to that disrespect and not the validation of the real community knowledge. And then we think we're very clever. There's us and it's them. We're very supreme, I know best, you know nothing, and it causes that divide between us and start breaking down in trust. And because of that, we have a very narrow, narrow view of looking at Ebola or any other IPC matter, and we don't look at the broader determinants of that problem. And we start medicalize, medicalize people's health, take out the social components. And then we have this huge problem, like mind the gap, We've got the insider views, the community, we've got the outsiders, the so-called experts. We all have different ways how we construct knowledge, how we view a problem, our gaze is very different, our professional training, our background, and our lived experience in a community. Also, we like stats, data. The community can relate to that. Mostly they like narratives, stories. So we need to translate the data into a story that's acceptable. And it leads to that whole beneficiary gap. Who really benefits in the end? Is it still that very dominant, almost a culture of biomedicine moving in? And we quickly with surveillance, risk assessment, needs assessment, and that word interventions. What does that say? We intervene. Do we really help? Do we sustain? Do we build? Or do we just intervene? So you have to just think, what are we saying? What does that word mean? And already we notice a whole contentious history of research and conventional approach in the community. People refer about colonizing methodologies. People come in from different countries, say, this will work. And it's like a cookie cutter approach. You will just do this. It is harmful. There's a lot of evidence about this community feel sometimes exploited by this whole approach and resentful. And communities talk about like parachute research. People come in. They do a bit of work, and they're gone again. And helicopter style the same, or what I call nip and tuck. Sometimes people come into a setting, they tweak a bit here and there, and they go home again and sit and watch from the outside. And it's a wonderful expression from a native Alaskan saying that researchers are like mosquitoes. They suck your blood, 
and then they leave. So then we have this real translational gap that we have this knowledge we really construct through our conventional ways, but then we try to implement it in a way that's effective and culturally appropriate, and we've got a problem because sometimes our roads, we're not on the same track and we can miss each other. And that's possibly because historically, if you look on the red side, we tend still, if you hear the language as well, we work on or in or for communities, hence it's a massive red mark. We don't really want to be there. Some people are shifting towards saying, well, we're actually working with communities. And ultimately, we want that green arrow, which is tiny at the moment, is to really say, the sponsors must be for the community, by the community, and with the community, and ultimately community-driven. And if we think about the word healthcare provider, what does that say? Can I really provide health to someone? Am I more a facilitator of health? Do I take, again, that responsibility away? Say, I'll provide health to you. So just have to really analyze and unpack these words we use. So I think some of these issues lead to what I call this whole disease control disconnect, because we focus so much on viral transmission, and but we have that systemic exclusion of the community. And that leads to, as we've seen with Shaheen's presentation as well, blaming start happening, there's stigma, social rejection, people can't come back to the communities after Ebola, or they've been killed, we just heard of a health worker, also sadly um, being attacked, and it creates fear. So responses start being built on the foundation of fear and not fact anymore. And we can see that happening in individuals, communities, and even in country settings. So just some examples you might have seen is a panic it's created. A mobs running into a, taking over a containment center, telling people, leave, 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 because the view is that people have been taken from my family and they die, they never come home, so damage is, harm has been done in these centers, get out as soon as you can. We've seen as well um, whole communities being sort of quarantined, and then you see this statement that came out, again, look at the blaming. We've been unable to control the spread due to continued denials, cultural bearing practices, disregard for the advice of health workers, and disrespect for the warnings by the government. Now again, just to see what is it, if it's factual, how can we change that? Or is it just very easy to blame the other without really looking deep in ourselves to find a better way forward? So to me, ultimately, these affected communities are very much the sort of the repositories of unrecognized knowledge and experience that we need. And we really need to work with them and rapid so entry, community entry, IPC method, of course it is critical, but we also really look at this containment efforts, bringing in that concept of cultural humility, and I will discuss that. Look at if we can have a fusion of the community protocol, meaning that's the cultural values, the customs, the practices existing, and if we can somehow fuse that with our controls, but without compromising safety. If that's possible, maybe sometimes it won't be, but I'll give some examples that came from community members. So that leads us to a certain lady sitting in this room with a beautiful orange scarf said to us a week ago, guys, can you come up in about five days or a week? Five steps, very quickly, how we engage with communities. And we thought, okay, we'll try our best. We actually did, and we came up with eight steps. So we've even surpassed that sort of statement. So it's called the CARE model. It's still in development. Stands for Community Assets, Responsiveness, and Evaluation. Okay? And that's the way we can try to control Ebola or any other um, disease containment as well. This model is really trying to give us some guidance uh, for development, implementation, and to evaluate that community engaged, um, responsive, and cultural sensitive to disease control efforts. And we focus very much on prevention, its treatment, and self care. So, that is grounded in practice based evidence. What we've done is we've looked at um, evidence, there's a lot around the world, sadly, not in Africa look at culturally appropriate ways to engage the communities to address really serious um, health issues. And also we've gone to people with experience in community engaged work and in IPC and EVD and viral hemorrhagic fever controls and asked them, give us feedback. Also, we went to um, Sierra Leone and asked them, tell us from your experience, can these steps work? Also, be involved as a survivor and we're currently waiting for additional feedback from communities. Okay, these are the eight core steps. I will explain them very briefly for you, one at a time. So, first of all, community entry with cultural humility. So if we do that, that means all of us, whenever we work with a community, your patients, there are communities as well, a commitment to learning and you validate that community expertise. 
That is their knowledge. They have the intelligence of that community. We do not. And look at that community protocol. What is currently happening? That, if we apply cultural humility in our approach, it really asks for critical self-reflection. That's why I asked you this morning, on this journey with me, this presentation, think about yourself, your practice, your colleagues, your teams, your facility. Look at your own bias, assumptions we make about each other, of the other, and commitment to that respectful partnership. You want to build trust, mutual and reciprocal trust, and learning. When you enter, importantly, go in with a trusted community leader. Don't just turn up. Imagine you sit under your tree or at home on your porch and all of a sudden these guys appear out of the blue and start spraying you. It's not on. You won't accept that. I certainly won't. So it's, we should be very careful and avoid those unexpected sort of um, appearances. Of course, we need to identify who are these leaders. And one feedback that came from Sierra Leone is, please, please, please put in female. The tendency is we talk about community leaders. There's a shift we think about men. They said, no, no, females ask men and women. So it's in there. And again, but go in with someone as trusted by that community. And then you start asking simple questions. Just ask them, who do people to go to here for advice or help in your community? When the community had a problem in the past, who came to help to solve it? Who stepped up? Who's someone that will always be there to fight for the community's well-being? Who gets things done? And then also, any other respected community leaders. You don't know who they are. And we tend to go with the NGOs or certain leaders, but actually there's layers and layers of different people who are respected and trusted. It's important to keep that into consideration. Then the third step is that really reciprocal learning, trust, and respect. So you arrange that meeting, now you know who are the identified leaders, ask if you can see them. And again, it's important from the IPC team or disease control team, go with an appropriate gift. Your community members will tell you what it is. It might be a gift, maybe it's food, maybe it's a bag of rice in certain communities, or there's a cultural process to follow. Follow that. Then you discuss with them what is a medical protocol, explain why we have to do certain things. And that's the whole aim is to provide them for no, with knowledge for their own increased safety, for prevention and for action from the community level. And then with them, you identify some of the practices we have, what, which ones, if any, or all of them, are maybe not totally culturally sensitive and can we work on those. Then you also, next thing is important, is to sit down with the community and you map what are the assets in that community that can be used for health promotion, but also to prevent disease. And that improve, increasingly we feel it must include the survivors of Ebola. Okay, we term them at the moment peer health promoters. Again, last night, watching television, they interviewed a boy, he's nine years old, and he said he's the only one left in the entire family. Mom died, father died, grandparents, all his siblings, he's left, he survived it. He's stepping up, he's going around, he's now educating people. This is what you need to do. Please take precaution. In that same village, the communities got together, they've started their own treatment center. Now, they said, because we've asked for help, no one is coming on board. He stepped in as the inside consultant to tell, this is what happened to me, be careful, be careful, this is what happened to my parents. So, community knowledge, it is there, the people are there, the resources, we just need to tap into that. So clearly that guy needs help as well, but who's there to support him and make sure that the whole team, that whole community response is done safely. And then you map these assets and you really look at that, what can we use to try to fight about it. Could be, for example, schools, clinics, shops, barber shops, uh, mobile taxis, anyone that can you could use in the community will tell you who are the key people and the structures in that community system. And then with the help of the leaders, then you identify that community protocol, look at in relation to what is the practices in terms of illness and the beliefs in illness and death, about accessing services, food, and any other needed resource in that community. What is the standard practice, the norm? Here you can see on the right, children mapping, adults, and this is done in Nairobi, not directly with Ebola at the moment, but we thought this is a system we could use. Um, they have a GIS mapping system, they train community workers, they go around, they map where people live, and we thought we can link that in maybe with issues of health as well to identify where there might be problems, where the resources are, and how we can harness the resource to respond to the problem. So there are various options available. Interesting website if you want to look at it, that is the um, Shack, Slum and Shack Dwellers International Organization. Very strong, doing fantastic work in communities. Uh, and I will advise you just access them. And again, we're waiting for feedback from them. We should get it tomorrow about this model that we're proposing. Um, then once you have this sort of the cultural protocol, to see if you can adjust 
what we do, the IPC side, but not to compromise safety, but to honor that protocol. And then also clearly identify what are the best modes and methods of communication to and from the community. Because quite often we just walk in, we think leaflets, leaflets, but are they really appropriate? And the community can tell us. Um, then you jointly adjust that protocol if it's possible, based on that knowledge you've learned from the community, they've learned from you, and see, can we adjust anything but remain safe and culturally sensitive? And these are some of the ideas that came up from the community. They ask, for example, is it possible to have a brief prayer before a family member with symptoms are taken away just for admission? Because the moment you just go in and grab and you run, where is respect? Where is acknowledgement for that being? It's still a person. So they ask, is it possible? Next one, please, can you update the family on the location and the health condition of my family member? Last night again, you can hear I was in front of the television, but they interviewed a few young people. They said, we've all been orphaned. And a little girl, she said, I don't know where my parents are. They took them away. I don't know where they are. I don't know if they're alive. I don't even know. I just don't know. There's no communication. One way, moving in, pull the bodies out and run. It's not on. Also, they asked, would it be possible if someone died in their home environment, could the body be double wrapped in a person's own coffin? because even in the poorest communities, quite often people, they have their coffins or access to, followed by a brief prayer before that person is then removed. Is that possible? Also something that came to last night from Sierra Leone, they asked, could it be possible after cremation, can the ashes be returned to the family if they would like that? Because quite often there are later ceremonies, sometimes 40 days afterwards. Now it might not be possible, that is absolutely fine, but explain that to community. This is not possible because, and again, it's mutual education, and find ways around that. Again, this is what we try and, try and prevent, that people are just being taken away, people, communities might not understand, and again, someone, oh sorry, someone dying, just being taken away from the home environment, and again, no time to say goodbye or the prayer. So we can change things in partnership with community. So then, you've got all this detail, you now know in some aspects you can adjust the protocol, Call a community meeting, oops, but not by you, but by that respected chief or the community leader. Get all the communities involved, but importantly, if you invite it, we go along as well to be present. Again, the whole thing is reciprocal learning, so we go in with not this is what you need to know, but with a whole frame of mind that what can you teach me, what can I learn from you, what can you learn from me. I don't tell you, yes, I'm learning from you as well. And that's part of that foundations of trust and respect. And then you discuss that joint protocol, if you could change it, and the whole community understand. And importantly, step six is that multi-way communication we talked about earlier. Make sure people can talk to you. You know what the right modes and methods are. Some ideas that came up again from Sierra Leone was street theater. That's stepping up big time now. There's music, videos being done, played on radio. And we also thought cell phone texting, as Shaheen also mentioned, if it's appropriate, and iPads in the future. We're thinking future as well, not only now. Um, and of course, m &E, as you go along, it's a different way. Make sure that there's continued attention to that community and cultural context throughout that disease control to make sure we're getting it right. And the two main questions is, are the overall efforts adhering to the joint that community protocol we've designed to ensure that community engagement is responsive, culturally sensitive, without compromising safety? And the second question, is the joint protocol perceived as improving the community's responsiveness to and trust in those degree and disease control efforts. Sustain feedback with the leaders, tell them what's happening, keep them the pro up progress, in including the survivors and the families, and then if possible, make those adjustments if you can adjust it all to strengthen overall community engagement. Big important to us, sustainability. When people are starting to leave, plan that in partnership with the leaders and the communities. Let them know when people are going to leave. Don't just disappear as suddenly as you arrived. Because overall, we need to make sure that empowering process for prevention, treatment, self-care continues by the community and for the community. Because in the long term, it's not only about Ebola now, we want to build this health community so that in the future, we can prevent these outbreaks through local capacity. That's not only the community, but the healthcare workers as well. So in conclusion, as we said, strict adherence, of course, it is absolutely vital. There's no debate about that. But through more of a community engaged approach, we can maybe make simple adjustments 
that's more culturally sensitive, they can understand it more, it reflects more of that protocol, so ultimately it responds to their realities and concern for their benefits. And if we do that, it might just be possible that we can move from a very scary, fear-driven response to one that's actually, if it works, it doesn't, it should work, it should have said care, based on care and not based on fear. I would just like to acknowledge a few people that this is now playing up. Can you just put them back, please? Otherwise, I'll just talk it through. Um, just to acknowledge, first of all, ICANN for being able to present this, and also for Stellenbosch University for making funds available, also Department of Health, Western Cape. Sorry about this, don't get motion sickness. And also the communities so far who've all given us feedback on this. It's just very slow now, sorry. So from that, we can move to a model that's driven by care, not fear. All the acknowledgements, thank you. And any questions, I'm happy to talk to you later.